This morning we're continuing in the Lord's Prayer, but to do so, let's turn to the last chapter of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. And 1 Peter chapter 5 is Peter addressing a group of people that were living in a culture so much like ours today. It was a cutting-edge, cosmopolitan, most advanced part of the Roman Empire in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and Peter is writing a letter to churches that are scattered all over that province. And the people had one thing in common, and it, it is the reoccurring theme of this entire epistle. And it's the fact that they came to Christ and they're facing hostility. And he is explaining to them how you go through life with the world against you, the culture against you, uh, the demons and Satan arrayed against you, and your own flesh that's constantly at odds with God's purposes. So it's like everything is stacked against us, and so Peter says, I want to introduce you to the God of all grace. The one the Lord's Prayer says is our Heavenly Father that we cry out to. So the question is, what can Satan do to us as believers, the ones who we share a common father, God is our father, if we are born again, and we have a common head of the church, Jesus Christ, so we are believers. If we don't seek our Heavenly Father's protection, what can Satan do to us? You know, there are those that, a whole segment of Christianity, they're always binding Satan. It's an interesting thought. I always ask him, how long can you bind him for? Uh, if you can bind him at all, why don't you just bind him once and for all? And what we find is that the Bible never tells us to bind Satan. It tells us to ask our Heavenly Father to deliver us on a daily, constant, moment-by-moment -moment basis from the evil one. But what happens if we don't? That, that's the whole question for us this morning. What is it Satan can do to us if we neglect this? In fact, there are believers that go through life without ever invoking the protection of their Father in heaven. What happens to their lives? Well, the answer, and if you want to look ahead, it's in verse 8. He devours every one of us who don't seek the protection of God. So, what can Satan do to us as believers if we don't seek God's protection? Today, the most cunning terrorist in the universe is stalking us as Christ's followers. We who have proclaimed that, that we are his sheep and we are going to follow Christ, immediately that separates us from the rest of the world. The whole world lies in the arms of the evil one except and, and slumbering in spiritual lethargy and blindness. And all of a sudden, out of the crowd, we sit up and our eyes are opened when we're born again. Acts 26, 18 says, we are eyes opened, the lights come on, we're turned from the darkness, we start heading toward the light, our sins have been forgiven, and we become temples of God. Boy, do we stand out in the spiritual world. The vast majority of people are dead in their trespasses and sin. We come alive. We, we stand up among all the dead, blind, uh, numbed, lost people and start walking toward the heavenly city, the celestial city, as Bunyan called it, toward the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, as the writer of Hebrews calls it. And we become targets. It's like getting out of the foxhole and walking across the battlefield. And so this most deadly terrorist in the universe is on the prowl stalking us with the goal of devouring us. He's called a roaring lion. He comes after each of us who leave open the door to him. He is called our adversary. He was God's adversary. He was not our adversary until we became followers of God. With salvation comes a lifelong struggle. We now have to struggle against our flesh within, we have to struggle against the world around us, and we have to struggle against the God of this world himself, Satan, God's adversary that's now become ours. And the Lord says, Satan can devour us any time we let our defensive perimeter down. 
you know what your defensive perimeter is? That's what 1 Peter 5 is all about. Peter is writing to a group of believers that are facing the onslaught of the Roman culture. They're facing the onslaught of all the hostility that people can direct toward followers of Christ that aren't going the same direction they are. The Roman Empire had constant festivals and all types of activities that Christians, when they became saved, could no longer participate in. The Christians stopped going to the gladiatorial events. The Christians stopped going to the theater because they had public nudity and lesbianism and homosexuality and just plain old common fornication as part of the theater. And the Christians withdrew and said, we are Christ followers and Christ would not participate in that and we won't either. And the hostility of the Roman Empire became strong. And it became fiery trials because Paul said all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. To the Thessalonians, he says, do you not know you were called to suffer? When we step up and, and, and come alive in Christ, we become targets of the hostility of the world, but especially of the evil one. He is able to penetrate, Satan can, any safe room, any secure location, and any security system. Satan and his demons are unseeable, undetectable, unstoppable, except by one security system. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful to be marketing this? The only security system against the devil is God's. And that is actually what we do share with people who are walking according to the course of this world, who are dead in their trespasses and sins. We say, you can have security here on earth and eternally through salvation. There's only one perimeter. There's only one defense. There's only one weapon that works against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it's the truth of God. It's God's Word. It is receiving the implanted Word which brings salvation. And so, this morning, as we continue our study of the Lord's Prayer, we've come to the topic what exactly can Satan do to us as believers if we don't do what this sixth petition says? If we do not seek God's protection, what happens? Nothing or something? And the Bible clearly says something. Satan can swallow us, devour us, and render us useless for God's purposes if we allow him to. So, 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to read the first 11 verses. Let's stand together. You follow along. Listen, I'm going to read whatever version you have. Uh, should say about 98% exactly the same thing in different order. But I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Verse 3, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that doesn't fade away. Verse 5, likewise, you, younger people, Submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Verse 10, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. 
To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's bow together. Father, I pray that you would open your word to our hearts by your spirit. May you draw us this morning to an even more complete surrender, yieldedness, consecration, so that you can sanctify us more and more through your word, through your truth, and by your spirit. And I pray that we would not merely hear truth today, but be stirred to say by your grace we want to be doers. We want to seek your protection, lest Satan devour and render us useless for your purposes today. We ask that for your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated as you're seated. Basically, what Peter is saying is that living for Christ is very difficult in a hostile world. These people were living in chapter 1. If you want to look back at 1 Peter, it lists off their geography in verse 1. They were pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Those are just the, the, the geographic portions of what is modern-day Turkey that's much in the news. That was the epicenter of Roman culture. It was the most advanced cultural region of the first century. The Roman province of Asia was an amazing concentration of some of the greatest buildings and some of the greatest engineering infrastructure of the Roman Empire. In fact, some of the most beautiful freestanding aqueducts are still flowing with water today after 2,000 years. They're just marvels of engineering. That engineering was surrounded by a culture that was absolutely hostile to Christianity. Christianity was exclusive. Christianity said there's only one true and living God. He is the creator. He is the redeemer that died on a cross, and he is the judge. And he says that is sin, and you must repent. And people didn't like any of those things, and they were extremely hostile. And so here in the epicenter of Roman culture, God was building his church. And every day the believers would face the hostile world. And every chapter of 1 Peter has a repeated theme of followers of Christ resisted by the surrounding world and antagonized by their own flesh within. The traitor that wants to go the way of the world, not following Christ. And here in chapter 5, Peter sums up all the ways that Satan wants to defeat the church, devouring the members of Christ's body. In these first 11 verses of chapter 5, Peter speaks to all the various members of the body. He talks to the young, he talks to the old, he talks to the leaders, the elders, the overseers, the pastors, and to each individual member. And with a sobering warning, he tells of Satan's goal to devour us. And then he explains how to know if your security system is on. Kind of reminds me of, you know, some of the graphic 60-foot wide, 30-foot high pictures we see at times. In, in Jurassic Park, the velociraptors were those deadly carnivores trying to kill. They were checking the fence, trying to find a way to get out and to endanger the lives of the people. Very, very much what, what Peter is saying is that far more than any dinosaur is the god of this world who is checking to see whether or not we are walking in obedience you know what we find in the scriptures and we won't get till till next week lord willing but people in the new testament that allowed sin to dominate in their life satan came in and was able to fill them with horrific confusion and they lied and they sinned and some of them died. Ananias and Sapphira are very clear examples. Why have you allowed Satan to fill you to lie against the Holy Spirit, Peter said. They were Christians who left the door open of untruthfulness, lying, hypocrisy, and Satan swooped in the unprotected sector of their lives where they let him in. Well, with a sobering warning of Satan's goal to devour us comes an explanation of how to resist the devil. We are too, as the Lord's Prayer says in the sixth petition, ask our Father in heaven to deliver us from the evil one. 
which prompts us to obedient living. You can't say, I want to hallow your name, I want you to control my life, I want your will to be done, and live disobediently. It's, it's a unit. When you ask the Lord to, to give you the strength you need and to cleanse you and protect you, you follow through and are protected. It's a unit. And when we do that, we're protected and can resist the devil. Asking our Father in heaven to deliver us from the evil one will always prompt obedient living. And Peter explains what the indicators are. How do you know if you're living obediently? And, and what he gives is basically a list of the attitudes that accompany a surrendered life. What, what does someone whose spiritual perimeter of defense that God offers is, is all in place, what do they look like? Well, they exhibit these indicators that, that Peter brings out in this text. And I just want to walk through verses 1 through 11, focusing on what verses 8 and 9 say. We are to live the life of prayerful vigilance. We are to walk in step with God. And as long as we stay inside of that, of that area of obedience, the evil one cannot get in to devour us. It's almost like going through life in a shark cage, you know, just going through the ocean, having the great whites come up, but they can't get you because you stay inside that protection. That's what Peter is offering on behalf of the Lord. We are to live the life of seeking daily spiritual protection from our Heavenly Father, and a life that gets protected by God is one that cultivates these attitudes, and I, I call them chosen attitudes, because each of these has within it, and what's amazing is if, if you could see your text, because what I do is I take an orange marker, and every time there's a command, in the, the structure of the Greek language, in the grammar, I, I make it orange. It just jumps off the page. I mean, right now, if you're sitting close enough, you can see the orange. See all the orange there? Uh, it just jumps off the page at you. These are responses needed. They don't just happen. They're not automatic downloads. You have to click yes. You have to invite God to do these things. These attitudes are offered by God downloadable free of charge by request. We have to ask for them. And, and what are they? Basically, there are six of them. We have to choose to submit. We have to, the word is hupotasso, we have to line up behind the Lord. We don't go ahead of him, we don't go around him, we don't dawdle, we follow him. That's the Christian life. And submission is lining up behind and following. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. It's a choice. We talked about it three weeks ago. Some people follow at a distance. Some people are right on the tail. Some people are vroom, 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 vroom. But we, we follow differently, but either you're, if you're a Christian, you're following. Humility. Humility is a chosen garment. Colossians 3, clothe yourselves with humility. You know, this morning, do you know how long it took me to get dressed? Guess, 100 minutes. Did you know that? It took me 100 minutes to get dressed. I drove from Lawton all the way here, worked and worked and worked, and at quarter to eight, I looked up and I thought, oh no, you left your suit home. You know, and we've got all these baby dedications and they've got the kids with bows, you gotta wear your suit coat. So I drove 25 minutes back, and then I drove 25 minutes back, and I had already spent a half hour getting ready. It took me 100 minutes to get dressed properly this morning. It was a choice. Do you choose to clothe yourself with humility? On your way to church today, after you look to make sure hair and outfit and makeup or shaving is all great, did you say, and Lord, now above all this, I want to clothe myself with humility. What is humility? It's kind of like a, to use science fiction, a cloaking device. It makes us not seen, but Christ is seen through us. It, also, it almost makes us transparent, so what's really inside comes out. We are to clothe ourselves with humility so that it's not I, but Christ. And it's not my agenda, it's not my goals, it's not my desires, it's not my appetites, it's not my agenda. Humility makes me say, I want Christ and others. Do you remember the little song you sing as a little kid in Sunday school? Jesus and others and you. What a wonderful way to spell what? Joy. 
See, J is for Jesus because he has first place. O is for others. We meet face to face. Y is for you and whatever you do, put Jesus first and yourself last. That's what humility is about. It's a choice. It's a choice of lining up behind the Lord and clothing ourselves with humility so he's seen and then living by faith, trust. Exerting this sobriety that's in the text, constantly vigilant because the devil is checking the fence to see if we've left any doors open. And as we suffer the hostilities of the world, patiently enduring. So let's go through these one at a time. They're really beautiful. Number one, submission. Any lack of submission leads to Satan devouring us. Look what it says in verse five. Likewise, you younger people. Likewise, what is it likewise? It's going back to verses one through four. He starts with the leaders of the church and, and he tells the leaders of the church that they are supposed to be the greatest servants in the church. They're supposed to lead, look what it says in verse four. They're supposed to lead by being, or at the end of verse three, by being being examples to the flock without saying a word. They're supposed to show the compassion of Christ, the humility of Christ, the servanthood of Christ, the purity of Christ. They're supposed to be living examples of Christ. How do they do that? By lining up behind him, by submitting to him. And so likewise, verse 5, even if you're not an elder, you younger people, everybody, why does it say younger? Because the word elder, zakin, meant white-haired. It, it was primarily older people in, in the Hebrew culture were elders. They were revered because they were older. So he says, you younger, everybody that's not an elder, you submit yourself to those elders. Yes, all of you, look at this, be submissive to one another. It, it's not that there's this, this elite group, you know, the one-tenth of one percent or whatever we hear about in the news all the time. It's not the elites that run the church. It's the greatest servants. It's, it's those that most exemplify Jesus Christ. But all of us, by their example, submit to one another. We don't jockey, we don't fight and claw and selfishly seek our own way. We all say that we want to be followers together of Christ, even as you are. That's why Paul said, be ye followers together of me, even as I also am of Christ. Every believer is supposed to have someone else in their life to say, come on, follow me, I'm following Christ. What the parents you just saw, that's exactly what parenting is. That's why it's so hard. Because those little people are watching us all the time. And, and they go, boy, you just got you know, really angry. You, and they point, and boy, it bothers us when they point out our inconsistencies. We're supposed to be followers together of Christ. And we're supposed to ask other people to follow us following Christ. And that's what all of us submit to. We're all on the same journey. And we're all related to one another. And any lack of submission to the body, to one another, to the elders, and to Christ opens us up to Satan devouring us. Secondly, humility. Not getting dressed leads to Satan having an, an opening. Just like an unsubmissive, kind of a rebellious. Do you remember what it says in 1 Samuel 15 about this uh, submissiveness? Rebellion is like witchcraft. Unsubmissiveness draws Satan just like the occult does and witchcraft. And so just like that, we are supposed to also have this humility. A submissive person is also usually humble. A proud person doesn't want to submit to anyone. They want to have their own way. They want to be out in front and seen and, and running everything. And a submissive person is willing to step back and let Christ be seen and clothe himself with humility and transparently let Christ out. And humility is a choice. As I said in Colossians 3, we clothe ourselves with humility. And in verse 5, the second half, it says, be clothed with humility. The, the same concept. It's, it's like Paul said to the Colossians, that you take off the old garments of the flesh and put on all of the Christ-like, what, what also is called the fruit of the Spirit, that we have what I like to call a personality transplant. We take our old personality, the way that I am, 
and allow Christ to put the way that he is upon us. So be clothed with humility. Why? For God resists the proud. Why is it a door open for the devil? Because God is resisting us. God is allowing Satan to buffet us when we are not humble. Have you ever noticed when, when you're proudly going your own way, it seems like everything goes wrong at times? If you're a believer, it's because God's just dropping things in your way to, to cause us to be resisted. You know, there was something interesting in the news uh, this week. If you saw the picture, it was a security camera, you know, one of those surveillance ones that are everywhere. And I think it was in California, since most people live in California, and so there's a lot of crime in California because so many people are there. And some bad guy was running madly down the sidewalk, and some policeman was wildly chasing him. And this passerby acted like he wasn't even watching, and just as the bad guy came, he stuck his foot out. And the security camera caught him. And boom, the bad guy, wham, right on his face, and the policeman, boom, right on top of him. And the passerby just walks away, but the camera caught him tripping up the, the criminal. Did you know that when we don't clothe ourselves with humility, that God is not protecting us, and Satan can just put his foot out and trip us up, and we fall headlong into sin? if we don't choose. God will resist us, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, verse 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. God says, wait patiently for me, and if you humble yourself, you will have your exaltation. I will let everybody see that you, the greatest is the one who is the greatest servant, the most humble. Uh, the next element, indicator of our spiritual operating system being on after we're submissive and humble is trust. A lack of trust leads Satan to be able to devour us. Look what it says in verse 7. Casting all your care. You notice it, it's all your care. Not some, not a few. See, most people are going through life burdened. They're, they're struggling staggering under their cares. And it's their cares about their health and their finances and their family and their future and their job security, and they're just staggering. And the Lord is walking right next to us. And he's saying, if you trust me, cast your care. Just take that care. You notice it's, a, it's, it's not one or two. The whole load, put it on me. You know what we say? Mm -hmm. He doesn't know enough going on. <laughs> I've got to take care of this myself. The infinite, omniscient, omnipresent, all-wise, loving God can't handle this. I have to. And we stagger through life. And that is a lack of trust. And we, if we can't trust God with our care, if we are anxious, if we're going through life anxious, fearful, we've left open a door. The Lord says, your big burden is, is opening the way for the evil one to come right in under your load of cares and devour you. Cast your care on me. Why? Because... He cares for you. Cast all your care on him, verse 7, for he cares for you. God says, take every care in your life and place it where? Put them all on Christ. Then there's this next one, this self-control. By the way, this is one of the major words of the New Testament. This, this word is in every one of the Titus 2. Older men, older women, younger men, younger women lists. It's the only curriculum for the whole church, and every one is to be this. And this, this word, nepho, which means not drunk, but it's used metaphorically, not for alcohol, but for an unintoxicated, undistracted, un, uh, you know, focused wrongly life. It's a life that is self-controlled. It's the fruit of the Spirit saying, I'm not going to let my eyes run my life, my appetites run my life, or my pride, lust flesh, lust the eyes, pride of life. I'm not going to let any of those things run my life. I'm going to say no that's what self-discipline, that I bring myself under the discipline of God's Spirit. Be sober comes from nepho, 
And it means to be constantly unintoxicated with life. In fact, the scriptures 22 times tell us things that we are supposed to not be intoxicated by. And, and it's so important. It's the qualification for every elder, every deacon, every spiritual leader, this self-control. We're supposed to stay spiritually awake, and we're not supposed to be indifferent and distracted. And then the next word, Gregorio, vigilance, Gregoreo actually is where the word Gregory comes from, Gregoreo. It, it's the word uh, which means to watch, be awake, and be vigilant. It means to kind of stay alert to see what's going on around you on guard. And it says, be vigilant, the end of verse 8, because your adversary walks about like a roaring lion. Now, zoologically, if you look up lions, you know what is fascinating? When I read it, I didn't realize it, that lions don't roar until they've already calculated that they are within, you know, leaping, springing, clawing distance of their prey. And at that last minute, as they're coiled and ready to pounce, they let out that, that absolutely paralyzing roar, which aids them in the... But they don't, they don't roar as a warning to kind of clear the deck of all the victims. They stalk until they are calculated in their leap and they can get the prey. And that's why it says, watch out, because your adversary, the devil, is walking about knowing where your weaknesses are and waiting till he knows there's a hole like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Do you notice what Peter notes there in verse 9? He said, you're not alone. This isn't unique. It's not just you that's struggling. We're all strugglers. In fact, Paul called us soon agonizomai, agonizers. We're fellow agonizers. We're all going through life agonizingly going upstream. The whole river is flowing that way. When we got saved, the Lord turned our canoe around and gave us paddles and said, go that way. And I'm going to give you the grace to paddle through. And it's an agonizing struggle. Paul said so. Peter says the same thing right here. We're all going through the same thing. The Lord's Prayer reminds us we're a family with the same father. We're a body with the same head. We're going through the same struggles. All believers, past, present, and future, have faced. We have the same goal, and we're not alone. That's why a Christian isolated from the body of Christ is weakened and more prone to devouring. Because others around, it's kind of like going hiking together. And, and you're hiking together, and if someone falls over the edge and they're just clinging by a root, if there's another member, they help them up. If they're all alone, hmm, they have a lot less likelihood of getting back up. The other hikers say, hey, you need to drink water. Hey, your face turning red. Hey, you're breathing too heavy. Hey, you need a rest. Hey, that's not the right trail. Sweat's in your eyes. You're missing it. Come on. And they're walking through life helping each other. When you turn your ankle, they take your pack. It's going through life together. The church is a shared life, a shared body, a shared family. And we are, I mean, have you ever traveled? If you travel with someone, they say, could you watch my bag? You know, I'm going up to get something, or I'm going to the restroom. Could you watch my bag? If you travel alone, reminds me of my daughter, uh, the first time she went to Honduras, she was taking, you know, all these medical supplies, and she got to the to the airport, and she was there with these huge bags, and, and mom said, don't let anybody, you know, get into those bags. There's expensive medical gear. And she said that they wouldn't go through the bathroom door. She couldn't get them in. She would go, rrp, rrp, trying to get them in, carry all these bags, these, these pull suitcases. And finally she said, a woman that looked so honest said, young lady, your mother probably told you not to let anybody you know, touch the bags, but I will not take anything. Go in there. And, and, and she let her. And, and it was like, it was such a picture that most people are going through life alone with no one to watch their stuff. And we're supposed to be vigilant for all of us, helping one another, aiding one another. And as believers, we have the same goal and we're not alone. And then this last one, I think it's beautiful, the patient endurance. Look at what it says in verse 10. But the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while. 
Did you know that's the second time Peter said that? If you put your finger there, look at uh, 1 Peter 1 and verse 6. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, 1 Peter 1, 6, though now for a little while, if need be, you are grieved by various trials. Peter constantly reminded them that compared to eternity, our life is a very little while. And compared to forever, for a little while, it's a struggle. And the, what, the quality he says we need to have is patient endurance. If we are not patiently enduring, then we do not experience. Look what it says in verse 10. But may the God of all grace, when we're enduring hardship as a good soldier, when we're enduring hostility because we belong to Christ, when we are enduring the suffering that all that are godly in Christ Jesus will suffer, verse 10 says we get the God of all grace. I like that title. Did you catch that? The God of all grace. That goes right up with 2 Corinthians 1, 3, the God of all comfort. God is the one that's the source of all comfort. God is the one that's the source of all grace. God says, if you will patiently endure, I have all grace, and I will pour it out on you. Be vigilant, be sober, and patiently endure. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory after you've suffered a while, will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Verse 11, to him be the glory. Wow. Wow. You know what that means? We all need the God of all grace. That's why we pray to him. He's our Father in heaven. And we say, our Father in heaven, I want to hallow your name by seeking your protection. I want you to keep me, your security system on. I want the evil one not to be able to penetrate it. If there's any lack of submission, Satan will devour me. If there's any lack of humility, Satan will devour me. If there's any lack of trust, Satan can devour me. If there's any lack of sobriety, of self-control, Satan will devour me. If there's any lack of vigilance, if I'm slumbering and not watching and praying, Satan will devour me. And if there's any lack of patient endurance, I don't get the God of all grace. Do you see why the second Half of this petition says we need to ask the God of all grace to deliver us every day from the evil one. Now, do you remember who the evil one was? He's the ruler of this world. Jesus said in his upper room discourse with the disciples, he said, now the prince or the ruler of this world is coming after me. Satan is the God of this world. He is the spirit of the, of the spirit of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the children or sons of disobedience. He is the one who is prompting the world with all of their, their desires to kill and steal and destroy and to be self-centered. He's the God of this world. And it says in 1 John 5, 19, the whole world is lying under his command. He can cause the world to do this and that. He so controls their minds. They have no defense. It's almost like the drones now. They're starting to have drones that are getting hacked and they fly away because someone else overpowers the control system and flies them their own way. It's just like they've already hacked computers. Now they're hacking the drones. And and Satan is the ultimate hacker. And he has hacked into every mind except those which are regenerated by God And that's why the helmet of salvation protects us from his control. But if we don't seek God's protection, the evil one, the God of this world, can control us. Jesus said, I will no longer talk with you much. The ruler of this world is coming, 1430, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. And we all know that we're of God, but the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 1 John 5, 19. If you want to know how bad Satan is, he's the deceiver of Eden. Did you ever think what he did? The evil one was able to talk the first couple out of their daily walks with their very own personal creator of the universe. That's what was going on. They, Adam and Eve knew God and walked around and talked to him every day, walked through the garden, and he showed them everything he'd made. And Satan was able to talk him out of that. Satan convinced Eve and then Adam that what he had to offer was better than everything God had already given him. Think of what they were lured away from. They were lured away from knowing God personally, from hearing his voice directly, 
And the evil one tempted Adam and Eve when they were perfect, and he allured them away from God. Do you think he's any less powerful now? We're certainly not perfect. He's the deceiver of Eden. You know what's even worse than that? He's the devil of the wilderness. Do you realize that Satan pounced on the God of the universe at his weakest moment, Jesus Christ? Satan has no scruples. He has no uh, belief that he's not going to conquer. He just, he attacked God directly in human flesh without batting an eye and confronted him. Wow. The evil one is so brazen and so set in his way, he actually is willing to pounce on the Lord himself. The temptations of Matthew 4 is astounding when you step back and think about it. Satan knew he was attacking God, and he did it anyway. And what does he do with lessers than Christ? He disrupts our ministry. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, he said, I want to come to you again and again. But I was hindered. I couldn't. Satan disrupted me. In Romans 15.20, he says, I wanted to come and minister to you. Satan disrupts. And Satan is the one who, when the word is sown, he steals it away. Remember in the parable of the sower? And he's the God of this world that blinds the mind of those lest they should believe the gospel. When you share the gospel and people get glazed over, it's Satan and his demons at work. So every day we have to face the ruler of this world, the deceiver of Eden, the devil of the wilderness, the disruptor of our ministry for God, and the one who can blind our minds. And what are we supposed to do to make it through the day? Ask God to protect us. And we have exactly one minute to practice. So close your Bibles and grab your hymn books. And I'm going to grab with you a poem. It's on number 430. So go to number 430. And we only have a minute to do this exercise. And as soon as you find it, stand up. And we're going to read the words of 430. Okay, And we're going to read them aloud, and if you notice, something is repeated and repeated and repeated, and it's the idea, I need to ask for help. I need to ask for the God of all grace to help me. I need to walk in obedience to him so he can help me. And it's beautifully stated. You ready? Here we go, 430, together. I must tell Jesus all of my trials I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. Now the refrain. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. Second stanza. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make of my troubles quickly an end. Third stanza. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus and he will help me over the world, the victory to win. Now the refrain, I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray we would tell you all of our troubles and trials and struggles. You know them already, but you long for us to reach out like a child in need of their parent. And how you love to be the God of all grace, to protect us from the greatest, most powerful, evil, wicked, malignant adversary of God and us, the devil himself, the demons, the world around us, and our flesh, all opposing you. But we seek you and find you when we seek you with all of our heart. May we do so and say no to the devil today for your glory. In the precious name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.